episode 44. This is like the longest running series in the world in turf. Um, episode 44, we're going to talk tech and turf. We're joined with a bunch of people from around uh, the, the United States and around the world. And I think we're going to have a pretty good episode here. Um, I'm John Kaminsky, professor at Penn State in turfgrass science and director of the two-year program at Penn State. And I'm joined with uh, co-host and my partner in crime, Larry Stoll. Larry, I'll let you introduce yourself. Oh, I'm just Larry Stoll from Pace Turf, and I'm looking forward to this conversation because the tech is always uh, it's changing. Yep, I think so too. And uh, I'll introduce uh, people going around my screen here, and I'll start with uh, Erwin. Uh, Erwin, why don't you introduce yourself? And Hi, everyone. I'm Erwin Lecoq. I'm head greenkeeper at Winston Golf in Germany. So as you, as you can hear, I'm French, but uh, I will do my best to speak English. <laughs> well, you're going to just have to move on to... To the next next guy. I'm not sure who uh, is on your screen, but maybe uh, Kevin. Kevin. Yeah. How's it going, guys? Uh, my name's Kevin Auschel. I'm the. That looks hey, like uh, we lost Kevin too. <laughs> How about Adam? Have me on, guys. Uh, my name is Jason Van Buskirk. I'm the VP of Sales and Marketing for Greensite, and uh, Turf Cloud is our golf division of Greensite. We focus on digital platforms and digital data harnessing for. Uh, golf courses, land management, as well as drone technology. Okay, I guess Kevin, we'll try you again. Yeah, sorry there. Um, so I, my name is Kevin Hauschel. I'm the golf course superintendent at Metal Club, and uh, I've been using uh, Green Sites drone te daily automated drone technology for the last. Uh, this is the third third year, I think. And then uh, we have also adopted the Soil Scout system um, from Adam. Um, and we got that in practice as of about a, about a month and a half ago. Um, so, all right. And I think Adam, I think you're the last one, and hopefully John will come back in here sooner or later. <laughs> well, I'm, another thing I've just gone, but just going again. Adam Sedgwick from Soil Scout, um, talk, talking sensors and gathering data from below the ground. All right, and I'd, uh, I'm not sure exactly how we wanted to go down the line, but. Uh, these are the questions that sort of we can go around the room um, that, that are sort of um, interesting as we're trying to figure out how, how you guys got started uh, working with these types of technologies. And John may be back in there. I don't know if you'll chime in. John, are you back? I just got back, yeah. Okay, you want to take over? We're just talking about how we're going to uh, run through the questions. Uh, yeah, sure. I don't know what you guys said because I basically froze everybody up and then dropped out, as has been happening all day on Zoom. Um, uh, I, did you introduce the topics of what was going to be covered? We just got, no, we just got to the topics right now. We just, uh, just went around for the introductions. Okay. So um, what we did is we invited people here to talk about several different um, areas. One would be autonomous mowing, uh, getting hotter and hotter. Um, another would be digital job boards. Um, and Larry, if I cut out again, just take. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Tom's one. Uh, so <laughs> John's going to be in and out, I guess, on this whole thing. Um, and then, we're, well, the digital job boards, we're talking about um, the, the Turf Cloud and uh, Green Insight, we're looking at drones, those types of things. And then uh, more, I guess, um, transition from, you know, just sort of like soil sensors to, you know, having uh, equipment mounted sensors that are, that are flying around. And I guess uh, let's just uh, start off with the digital uh, job boards and then we can go on from there. Who's doing the digital job boards? I I mean I can I can talk about that Larry we've um, so I've been using turf cloud um, since I started the drone process um, so basically uh, with uh, hopefully when Jay gets back but basically it's a uh, oh there he is um, but basically, it's like any other job board. Um, it's very simple to use. Basically, it does all the labor tracking behind the scenes. Um, so we also are fortunate, they're fortunate enough, there's AI built in um, behind the scenes. And so they have this smart scheduling feature, which is really unique. Um, in the last few years, it's, you know, it takes about 20 minutes to fill out your job board every single day. Um, ever since they added the AI feature, um, which is just recent, it's been you know, it takes me about half as long to actually put the schedule up, which is great. Um, so everything that, you know, this, the job board and everything together that I've seen with their platform, is just to help create efficiency across the properties, justify 
the costs, um, labor, um, show membership, how much you're spending on greens versus on bunkers, that kind of stuff, and vice versa. And so it's eye-opening to a lot of them when you have that information in front of them to see where the numbers are actually going. Um, you know, we spend on, we've done the numbers, we spend about $1,000 per a bunker per year um, in terms of labor and et cetera. And when you put that in front of a member, when you have 112 bunkers, it it's an eye jaw dropping um, number. And so it, it just helps a lot of these, the job board specifically is just a helpful tool in terms of justifying costs on our end um, to give the membership what they really are desiring and conditioning and in a, a playing service. Yeah, it seems like a lot of these technologies are kind of uh, geared toward aiding in communication, not only with, I think, with the committee members, but also crew and staff and um, trying to uh, just make it easier to, to manage the course. Yeah, I correct. Know. Yeah. Go ahead, Jay. Yeah, I think of um, Jim kept kicking me out. Sorry, guys. So, you know, our our, our concept on, on digital job boards is, is really improving productivity. Uh, superintendents are so oftentimes uh, busy, 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 and having to radio back into the shop to change things on the whiteboard. Having a digital job board at your fingertips, literally in the computer in your pocket, being able to change that on the fly uh, really helps. I, I would imagine that it's it's helped increase productivity for Kevin uh, and, and certainly Erwin. Um, he's looking at his whiteboard behind him and he's wishing he had a digital job board. And And so, you know, when I was a superintendent, uh, I had a whiteboard and it was a very colorful one. And, and they're always, I knew there always had to be a way of more responsiveness in, in being in touch with not just, you know, membership, like Kevin said, but also my staff and, and my, my, you know, my assistants, my, my foreman and, and my mechanic. So um, making it a, a touch point that uh, goes a lot deeper than just assigning tasks is, is the more valuable asset to, to managing with a, a digital job board. How many years are we into having digital job boards? Um, I know that some people have, you know, built their own and I look at it and I'm like, Oh God, what a waste of time to build your own when there's job boards out there. But how long have they been around? You know, um, it was 2009 that I had gone to a, a seminar at GIS and um, Darren Patinsky actually was the, the host of the seminars data equals knowledge equals power. And, and it was all about Excel and what Excel can do for you. And, and I went back to the shop, and I said, I can do this in Google Drive. And so I started creating my own job board in 2009. So this is, this is 11 years ago when, when I started creating digital job board um, and, and making it so that my, my staff could see it. Uh, and at the time I thought maybe, you know, this is, this is kind of cutting edge, but I never thought that it was um, a worthy thing to, to push on others. Uh, and, and, you know, here we are, you know, a decade later and um, you know, they're starting to pop up a little bit more often. So Darren's in this chat too. So he's probably not going to send you a bill for royalties for uh, <laughs> inspiring him. I talked to him. Uh, so today's Thursday. I talked to him Tuesday at great, good length. So um, I have a question for you, Kevin. Um, so here I have what we do an Excel job board. And then it took me quite a while to get my staff to log their hours on it because they are on the older side of the, of the industry. And then, they're, they're not used to the technology. And how was the transition for your staff, your Kevin, from whatever you had before to the full digital board? Yeah, for, for us, it, I'm, I was fortunate. The staff just, overall, we had ASB Task Tracker before I switched to Turf Bob. Um, and so for me, I, we've had job boards on property for uh, at least six years. Um, and so, you know, all right, it was an easy transition to switch to Turf Cloud. What I would say was for us was the ease of switching into Turf Cloud. Um, it was an easy setup and the crew really, just because how simple it was, the job board was very easy to read. It's easy to put notes on, that kind of stuff. And so I was able to really communicate, you know, well um, with, the, with the team in terms of, and they've gotten used to it. But the main thing for me, the reason why I chose Turf Cloud was I was paying a subscription to five to six different companies and they all have different passwords. They all have different databases. They all are kind of operating different ways. And so they don't communicate together. And for me, that was appealing is I'm, 
you know, if we can create something where you have one umbrella and all my data is going into one dashboard. Um, and that's kind of what they created for me was my drone talks with the, um, you know, it, I can access that from the job board. I can access my egg track. I can access equipment track. So when my uh, equipment managers are putting in, you know, timing for, and there's a, or, or a servicing that kind of stuff. So there's all sorts of different ways that I'm able to get data and track it. And so, you know, we can look at mowers and go, okay, this mower is starting to cost us a lot of money. Boom. We, you know, it's time to replace it, that kind of thing. Um, and that's where putting in the parts and putting in all that time. Is there a learning curve? Yeah. Um, does it take probably about a year, year and a half to really get everyone on board and moving in that right direction? Sure. Um, but the overall efficiency, once you get to that point, now the team, they don't know anything else. Um, and my irrigators specifically, they won't, you know, they, they won't leave or do anything until um, they've seen the job board or, you know, or all the crew. Basically, then it's just, there's less confusion, less time of them running into me because I'm able to put notes up there, that kind of stuff. So it's, I think with anything, you're going to have a learning curve, especially with an older, um, when you have an older uh, staff, which we do. Um, so. Thanks. Thanks. Hey, Jason, can you talk a little bit? One of the things that I was interested in is the AI function on that. I don't know if I dropped in and out. I don't know if anybody, can you talk a little bit about that and kind of what it yeah. does? Mm, yeah, sure. I might actually poke on Steven in the call here. Uh, he actually developed, um, developed it himself. Um, our, our belief on AI for the job board was uh, instead of just assigning tasks individually one by one uh, and then also backtracking to previous dates in the calendar, uh, we wanted to make it so that the system would read what data was being put into the system and allow the superintendent to look at suggestions being made on who does what most often. And, and then when you keep assigning these tasks, you can pick on them and choose them to assign to multiple facets. So if you wanted to have five people going out to hand mow greens, you can click, you know, Kevin, John, Adam, Steve, and Larry to go out and mow greens. And then me and Erwin are going to go out and, and rake bunkers because the, what, seven of us are the ones that are doing jobs most often in the database. So um, Steve, do you have anything that you might want to add to, to you know, AI for, for the job board? Yeah, sure. Can you guys hear me okay? I think this is the first time I've spoke. Can yep. everybody hear me? Yep, Great. sounds good. Yeah. Excellent. So yeah, so, you know, I guess I would just add that kind of a little bit of insider information about Greensite that a lot of people don't know is that, you know, Greensite, golf is very important to Greensite in Turf Cloud, but uh, a large part of our business outside of golf is actually, uh, we work for the defense industry. So we have, you know, uh, several handfuls of employees that sit and develop artificial intelligence and robotics for for the military and for DARPA, for other, and, and other confidential clients. But, so we have this, this team of engineers who are just, I mean, they're absolutely brilliant. And, you know, Jay and I are fortunate, you know, having teamed up with Greensight and having Turf Club been acquired by Greensight, uh, that we have access to these guys. So what they've done is consider uh, sort of like a Nest Learning thermostat, I guess, was, was the concept, right? I mean, how can we not, how can we make the job board learn from what you've done and what you've input in the past uh, and take into account a number of other factors as well, such as growing degree day models, um, weather, for example, um, kind of hyper local weather as well, uh, your past job board data, um, what you do in, in, in seasonality, um, other data inputs, uh, other data points, including our drone data, what we see um, versus what you schedule. And soon to come soil field data as well, but take into account all these data points that we're able to gather about your property. And how can we then use that to your advantage and save you time and, and help you make decisions, you know, not just provide you with, you know, this other tool in your tool belt, which is a great and valuable tool, as Kevin has said, but, you know, how can we go the next step? What can we do? So we did, we just mo most recently uh, deployed this AI feature to the job board where we're looking at all these key points and, you know, kind of like your Nest Learning Thermostat 
you know, we can predict what you're going to schedule. So pretty much what it shows is a list, you know, of your, of your top 30 most scheduled uh, or high, most highest predicted jobs for the day, ranked from one to 30. And you can then easily accept those jobs into your job board and, and, and schedule them to multiple employees. Uh, and, and it only doesn't just predict what jobs that you, that you can do. It also predicts which employees are most likely to do that particular job. So it provides you with a list of employees that are most likely to be assigned to that job. And you can just kind of quickly accept all of these and assign it to your job board. And that's what Kevin had mentioned about saving you time and using AI to help you be more efficient. So. Larry, it just like blows my mind because I'm thinking about it and I'm looking at you with your fairy ring uh, picture in the background. I'm like, holy shit, to be able to do that and then say they have weather data and predictive models of pests that are on there, right? So say dollar spot is an easy one. You use the Smith Kearns model, you integrate it into your dashboard. And then it's like, which fungicide do I want to choose? And it knows what fungicides you've already choose. And it could say, you're using that one quite a bit. Maybe you should think about using a different one and all that be AI integrated into like the decision making. Um, I mean, oh, yeah, just, well, I'm guessing they'll go out and they'll start, you know, checking pricing, you know, for fungicides and figuring them out and, you know, you have your program drift, you know, what you're going to need to be putting down, what is, what's the pricing, what am I going to put down now? based on what I need, you know, in the future too. So yeah, I think it's. it's yeah. And huge. I think of like the kayak, it's like the, I use kayak for my like travel. It's like the kayak of like pooling sources of all the thing. And it's like, here's the product you use. This is the person that's selling it the most cheapest right now. Like, um, you know, we're a ways away from that because we have distributors and it's not just all online, but, um, but man, the possibilities are crazy with that. You know, I mean, yeah. and, and really what it comes down to, if I could just interject again quickly is, you know, having industry partners, right? And, and having as much of that data under one roof as possible is really what empowers this and enables it, right? I mean, you know, you can get, you can get data points from, you know, National Weather Service or, or whatever other kind of APIs or, or sources of data that are, that are just available to everyone. But, you know, if you have your job board data separate from your equipment data, separate from your agronomic practices data, um, you know, if, if none of those databases can be pulled upon and looked at by this AI, um, you know, then it, it becomes less impactful. So, you know, I think we're, we're really fortunate, if we could transition a little bit, we're really fortunate to be able to partner up with, with, with people such as Adam and Soil Scout, where, you know, we, we, don't make the, we don't make the senses ourselves. We didn't previously have this data, but, but now we do. And it, it, it's really exciting to See how that can be impactful and, and how much of a role that will play in these predictions and in, in, in further AI implementation um, moving forward. Awesome. Hey John, that might be a good segue to Adam. Yeah, I think that that would be good. Um, maybe Adam, we can talk about um, your sensors and how those are integrated. And just, you know, Larry, you can chime in too, because I know you use a lot of soil sensors um, in testing when you're doing your consulting and stuff. Yeah. Um, Sort of just following on from from what Stephen and you guys were just saying about the um, the sort of fungicide program and that sort of thing, I think I think we're almost far enough down the road now where by looking at this data that we're able to generate either from management practices via via the digital dashboard and the AI and looking at what we've done historically, uh, looking at the soil data that we're pulling from under the ground by, by sensors for your moisture, temperature, salinity, and also looking at the imagery from above the ground with green sites of the product, the drone. We're, we're almost approaching uh, a road where, as I was saying to you guys before, once we learn the power of these numbers, where we can enter a world where we're more preventative rather than curative. And so ra rather than kill the problem as it happens, and stop the problem happening in the first place, and in, in turn, I think that will just improve everyone's efficiencies right across the board. But um, sort of the, the, the sensor world, which is where I am, I think right now is, is, is really taking off. There's, 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 there's massive interest right across the turf management world, be it, be it stadium grounds managers, be it superintendents, greenkeepers, or even um, city, city green area landscape managers. Because we're, we're looking at so many different parameters where the, the, there's, there's global problems. So water usage is a huge one, which the first thing people look at with the sensors is, is water usage, where they can minimize their water usage or, or 
maybe they sort of like Kevin, for instance, where it wants to use the same amount of water, but use it in areas that are, that are more needy um, and, and that sort of thing. But um, to me, I started looking at the bigger picture now and yeah, the water usage is fantastic. Minimized water usage. The, the golf course industry worldwide alone uses 16 and a half billion liters of water per day in, in a world that's running out of water. So if we can look at gaining efficiencies, even, even to 10% of that, it'll be fantastic. But um, if we start looking at things like the salinity levels from the guys that are using recycled water more and more from the cities, um, start looking at the moisture and the temperature together, uh, which is almost an underground humidity level. The, there's so many different factors that uh, people can learn a lot of information from this data, especially for guys like you, John, at Penn State and over here at places like Myoscoff and then the Syngentas and everyone in the world. I think going forward, in the very, very near future, this data that we're all generating between us from many different angles is going to become very powerful. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's no doubt. And Larry, maybe you can comment on some of the power of that um, in stuff that you're looking at, especially like you deal a lot with salinity issues out in California. Yeah, well, we, we, we looked at a, a lot of that stuff. I mean, the, the, I always thought it would catch on with the EM sensors, uh, which are non-invasive. So you just pull them around, you know, put them on a mower and move them around. And uh, those haven't caught on anywhere yet. I don't, I don't know, Adam, have you seen anybody using the EM sensors much? V very little, very little. And it's the, the, the thing with those sensors is the data is only live when you're there. Uh, you're probably only going to be there once a day. So generally you're looking at a, mi a minimum of 24 year 24 hour old numbers so it's a great practice and it's a great model for picking up some data but is it really accurate enough for us to gain efficiency and change any management practices i i, I think there's a i think there's only really two two types of sensor um for soil data that we can really look at and that's either the handheld, the Pogo, the TDR, that type of thing that everyone uses, and and th and those products are fantastic. Or the 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 underground wireless. Um, each product has its pros and cons. Don't get me wrong, but you have to work out which is more useful for yourself. Um, but but each one enhances the other as well. So I, th I think the mobile sensor in, in its infancy was a great idea. But I just think that the way the data is gained and the age of the data by the time it's usable doesn't really give us a lot to work with. Hmm. Yeah, I kind of disagree. But that, but I think the well, because I mean, you're talking about flying drones, which is a the same sort of thing. You don't fly it every five minutes, so it's kind of a there's always that level. I think 24 hours is that's a pretty good measurement. But I think the in-ground sensors are really key to pulling all the rest of it together. I think with the mobile sensors, like a drone or, or um, some sort of equipment mounted thing like, a, like an EM device with NDPI, something you're moving the sensor around, it gives you the whole course look and that maybe we're not so interested in just uh, one spot. So we're sort of looking at uh, variability across the, the facility rather than average. So we're talking about, you know, is every three meters that you're going along, if, is it variable? Or is it, um, or uniform? I don't know. That was just the way. I think they're both good together. Yeah. So, sorry, Larry. I, I, I translated a little bit wrong then. I think if you're looking at building patterns and looking at change in that sort of format, then they're great. I think that's very close proximity to the ground. That the the staff are very close by as well. So. They can almost take it towards issues if, if there's something visible, um, and and the same the same with the green site drone where it's the, the the drones building up this pattern of change, and if you've got whether it's the AM sensors, the drone, something like that, just building up a pattern of change, you marry that up with the data from your your Pogo TDR 
or from your waters and the ground sensor in Soilscape, Spio, whatever anyone uses, um, all of a sudden you can build a very, very tight pattern. You can look at the change and you can start to look at the, look at the reasons for the change. Yeah, and I think that's where the next, well, the generation as things are developing is how that, how you guys figure out how to automate that step. So it's like, okay, go to the, you know, 150 yard mark of fairway four on the left side, there's a hot spot or there's something going on. So, so, and that's, that's where I would say we're already at that point, not at our property. Um, and that's in combination of using where you have spec connect um, that connects to our drone imagery as well. So we're doing, I do three weekly audits of a week where our guys literally take our TDRs out and they'll go in between irrigation heads, et cetera. And basically we're trying to find that spot where that triangle, where the wind's going to affect the irrigation pattern, et cetera. And so what we're doing is actually, I've actually been able to take with in combination with the drone, the soil scouts, et cetera, it's just added a whole nother layer of efficiency across our property, not only with hand watering, but also in terms of we're actually, we do deficit irrigation across our property. Um, like some, most, a lot of people do in California. Um, but specifically, you know, I like seeing having the soil scouts in the ground, we were able to actually see when we're able to need to drop our global down. And so, when you're able to actually see the trends and that's where I think the soil scouts actually really do help me across the property in terms of the variation from, you know, of soil types, et cetera. I, you know, our irrigation systems are, it's going to be hard. We're really not as efficient per se when the, you know, there's so many factors, wind, um, et cetera, that can change your irrigation pattern and actually make it so inefficient. And what we're seeing is the drone is allowing me to see those inefficiencies. And then my irrigators are actually able to go out and preventively get to those spots before we have issues. And that's where I think we're getting more proactive is the overall quality of the golf course has gotten better and our efficiency numbers are slowly going down and down and down. And I've been able to, when I first started at Meadow Club, we had four full-time irrigators in the middle of the summer. We've now been able to cut that down to two um, and then add supplement in and maybe a third after lunch on certain days, et cetera. And that in itself is allowing me to divert that labor that we were using to that to now detail work that the membership is going to see. And so that's where I think you get this added value. It's not just in terms of we're saving water. Yes. And we're being efficient there and hitting numbers that we've never hit before. But at the same time, the quality of the product across the board is getting better. And, you know, it's because we're in a preventative mindset as opposed to a reactionary one, which most superintendents across the country are in. And in reality, it takes a lot more to get turf back water-wise than it does to actually keep it on that, you know, keeping the equilibrium right where you want. It. Yeah. And so yeah. that's why I think these, this, this technology and platform together, everything together is creating that environment where now we're not being reactionary. And you know, you're, you're continuing to add pieces. I mean, like you said, adding, you know, the, the fungicide stuff, that kind of, you know, any growing degree day models, you know, growth potential, that kind of stuff, they're, they're out there. And it's just a matter of getting it built into the pl platform, um, so, which even the them have been great with. Yeah. So do you, do you actually, do you look at an NDVI map to figure some of these out? You don't look at the numbers though, right? No, we're, we're looking at it, so we're, we normalize it. But then what I'm doing is then I'm going in, Greensight has the ability to, I can play with the NDVI filter. And so what I'm able to do is go in, I want to go see, if I drive around the property and I see stress in a certain area, I'm going to go back to that, da that daily image and I'm going to actually highlight it to show that stress that I'm seeing. And I want to make that, that's dry, that's, dry, that's either, you know, what, there's stress happening there. And so being able to set that, now I'm actually creating where the data is actually giving me something actionable. Greensight's gonna do their best to, you know, put in some normalizing. You know, they're gonna take the averages and give you a, a decent image. But the reality is that end where I'm able to actually control and get it to show what I want it to, what I'm seeing with my own eyes, 
then I know that the imagery is pretty spot on. And it's been pretty impress or impressive in terms of when you actually, you know, you can go out and go, oh, wow, look at that. That is stress there when I go out to that area. And so that's what, I'm, what I've seen is it's just now we're staying ahead of everything. And as a superintendent, it's a lot <laughs> – you're able to leave the property knowing that you're not going to, that's not going to die, you know, and my job's not going to be at risk, et cetera. So Steve, and um, you know, things like that, um, when does AI be able to use his personal input on his maps to set that, to then give selective warnings, not just based on a, you know, a color, <laughs> device, but so, when, is, when do you so, get good enough yeah. to do that? <laughs> so if I could back up a little bit and, and just kind of explain a little bit more what, what, what Kevin's talking about. Um, for someone who's never used uh, drawn imagery before, any kind of drawn imagery, or anybody that's familiar with looking at NDVI imagery, uh, an NDVI, NDVI image is, in essence, like a grayscale image. When you look at a raw NDVI image, it's just intensity values applied to pixels across an image that we've done math on. So, you, you know, the output is this grayscale image that isn't really particularly useful. Uh, so what you do to make that useful is apply what's called a color scale, a pseudo color scale to that grayscale image. So you kind of say, all right, you know, I'm going to pick a range of colors between red and green, red being like low NDVI values, green being uh, high NDVI values, and, and yellow in between being somewhat average across all, all of the pixels in an image. Uh, so you apply that, you apply that color scale, and if you kind of apply that color scale to all of the ranges of values, grayscale values in an image, you get kind of like a flat looking NDVI map that, that isn't really particularly useful. It's, it's just kind of like, oh, I've stretched this color map across some broad range of values and it's not really focusing in, on, focusing, focusing in on things that are important on the golf course. So what we do, we've already trained an AI actually uh, that segments areas of your golf course. So when you fly, um, our drone takes all the images, stitches them all together into one contiguous image. And then our AI looks at that and we can generate shape files that uh, pretty much outline uh, the extents of your greens, your tees, your fairways, your bunkers, your buildings, your roads, and your water, uh, and a, a couple other classes. With the idea being that we don't necessarily care what the NDVI value of a building is, because we're not trying to grow buildings, or water, or cot pads, right? So we segment all out all of the areas of turf, which ends up being this kind of, if you picture grayscale values in an image from zero to 255, that's much smaller range. I mean, just for conversation's sake, maybe 200 to 255 may be the values on your image now of just turf. So then you just apply that color map to that small range of values, and now you get a whole lot more contrast, and you, and you can see a whole lot more variability in your image. So what Kevin's talking about doing is saying, okay, I'm going to drive around the golf course, and where I see an area that's super stressed out, I'm going to go into my, my imagery, and I'm going to assign that color map to be red where I see that stress. So now what it's doing is saying, okay, all the other areas in the golf course where I have similar NDVI values that you know, we're now assuming are, are similarly stressed out um, are going to have that particular uh, color. So you're right. So, so there is that manual step where Kevin's kind of ground truthing itself, uh, himself in, in applying that. Um, so what we're, I guess the next step would be, would be to store uh, Kevin's adjustments, right? So we say, okay, well, Kevin has now, you know, our AI has determined that this color map belongs within this range of values. And Kevin is constantly adjusting that, you know, plus 10, minus 10 in whatever direction and moving the center or whatever. So we store those values and we, and, and, and we learn over time what those adjustments are. And then we apply that to the imagery moving forward, right? So that Kevin still has to start doing less of those adjustments. And in, in, in bringing kind of something else further into play is, you know, maybe different times of the year, he's making different types of adjustments, right? So you have to you factor in seasonality, uh, angles of the sun, maybe times of day. So you start looking at all these other data points and, and then you spit that back in and hopefully provide with even better information. Yeah, it's amazing. Hopefully yeah, that makes rain, sense. rainfall, temperature, all that stuff. Daily, go ahead now. Okay, can I jump in? Yeah, um, I have a question for you, Jason and Austin. Um, do you think, or maybe uh, Kevin, do you think like you can layer out some like the, the greens, like each green of their own layer, and then you can then have your own NDVI scale for each of them, 
because then you have a, a much smaller range and then the contrast is much higher. You think that's like something processable or it's like way too heavy? No, I think, I mean, I, I think that that's totally possible. I mean, that we, I mean, we set the color range around all of the areas of turf, but in reality, we could, we could center it around greens. We could, we could center that color map around fairways or around the first green or, or different areas. So yeah, I mean, we do have that information. Uh, um, currently, you know, the only implementation of it, and I don't know if anyone else is doing this, but the only implementation we have it now is you can kind of set markers or, or slices of a map uh, and then kind of fine tune towards those slices, you know, so you don't have to apply it across an individual map. But yeah, I mean, that's, that's what's possible right now. We do have the capability of implementing it, but we just, we haven't done that yet. So I appreciate the suggestion. Yeah, it just so, makes sense because one example, like my course, I have three courses. One is Ben Grass, one is Fine Face Q, like NDVI Libre, like completely different. And then that would kind of make me a fast scale if you take the big picture. But if you can cut course by course, green by green, then you have a very smaller range. So that's, that, that was just where I came up with them. Yeah. I have, a, I, have a, I have a question, Stephen. Are, are the... I lost you for a second, Larry. Are the green site influence of uh, sunlight? I, I didn't catch the question, Larry. You dropped out, sorry. Oh, sorry. Are the uh, sensors on the uh, drones uh, active or are they passive? With, they depend on sunlight? So they, they, they do, I mean, they're, it's, they're not, I guess the, the, the real question is, is that uh, are the, the NDVI sensors calibrated, right? So we're using reflectance targets to account for changes in light, right? Um, I would say that, in, and they are not, right? We normalize our data. So when you're looking at our data, uh, it's good for looking at trends. So for example, saying, okay, is the first fairway uh, have a lower NDVI value than the second fairway, you know? or other parts of the golf course, and how does that look? So every day over the last week, you know, the first fairway has had lower uh, NDVI values than normalized NDVI values than other parts of the golf course. What, what isn't possible, and it's kind of a, a distinction when you're looking at non-calibrated data, is when you're trying to compare the hard and fast NDVI values of one area day to day. So, you know, for example, maybe the first fairway has an NDVI value of uh, point 0.3, I don't know, whatever, random numbers, right? Um, in, in tomorrow, it has an NDVI value of point 0.2. Well, you know, those numbers are, are, in essence, kind of meaningless because it's not calibrated, right? So we, we don't necessarily know if it's improved or it hasn't. So when you're looking at normalized data, you really are just looking at trends uh, in comparison to the rest of the golf course. So if you see a bad area, um, Kevin's kind of, again, he's, 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 he's tuning his imagery to, to have the rest of the golf course be centered around what he has ground truth and what he has known. Um, the thermal imagery, though, or so the thermal imagery in the drone is calibrated. It is radiometrically calibrated. So you could compare surface temperature values from day to day. But, and you can also, again, you know, do that kind of um, uh, general trend comparison as well. So, you know, I, we, we could radiometrically calibrate our, our NDVI imagery, but it's just another step. And in, in, in really what we want to do is just try to make it easy and Kevin could speak to it but same with you know uh, the idea behind Erwin using uh you know robotic mowers we want to try to take the human out of the loop as much as possible you know we don't want the 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 golf course superintendent or whoever's flying the drone to actually physically fly the drone themselves you know we don't we don't want to have to have them put some kind of uh calibration plate on the ground and then hover the drone and then you know do all these things we we really just want them to put it out on the ground. We fly it all from Boston. The, they have to observe the drone as it flies, but the, we, we fly it all from Boston. The drone lands, you put it back, and it just uploads the data and processes the data all automatically without any kind of human intervention. So, you know, we don't, we're not trying to, to, to add time to people's day, right? We're trying to save them time and help them scout. So, um, and it, as far as the cameras themselves, they're, they're, they're modified RGB cameras with the NDVI uh, filter on it. So if that answers your question specifically about what type of sensors. Yeah, no, that's what, that's what it's, it's always been difficult to figure out which way to go. And we talked about ground mounted versus flying and, and uh, whichever one catches on the best. I, I, I preferred the ground ones because you could, you got an active sensor so you could run it at night if you wanted to. But uh, mm -hmm. I understand that the reasons for, for not having uh, that kind of an active sensor. And it's, I think it's gonna be, and then the AI 
I think, and, and with some ground truth, uh, and you got to, all this stuff has to be ground truth anyway. So it's, uh, it's going to happen. Or for, just the, that's where the soil scouts and, and, and the, the sensors that are in the ground permanently come into play, right? Where the, that's where the ground truthing comes into play as well. So, you know, it, once it all talks together, um, <laughs> we'll be able to really, really start making some, go to the next level, I guess. It's already very impactful, but that, that's where the next level occurs. I think the challenge to, to kind of add to, to Stephen's points is not so much um, grabbing this data and then giving it to the end user and then expecting all our users to be like Kevin and Erwin. And they're the ones that are dotting all the I's and crossing all the T's and they love it so much that they want to make it a second job. Um, that's probably 1%, 2% of our population, if we're lucky. It's, it's taking that information as a company and then adding it to the next level and making it a virtual assistant for the end user and then making suggestions like Larry, you were saying in, in terms of pesticide usage or irrigation, irrigation usage or, or labor management. It's that, that's our task. That's the tough task. I think as a company, Stephen and I had talked about this at length, even, even earlier this week and, and making it out to be like, Hey, this is, this is the next level. This is what's going to catch people on. We, we say pe we're, we're saving people's time, but are we really saving time? You know, obviously, you know, Kevin's said, yeah, 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 I'm sa you're saving time. But, you know, how many hours is Kevin actually looking at this data to be able to apply back to his property? And, and that's the feedback that I consistently get uh, when we're talking about drones and drone imagery and, you know, soil scout, whatever, whatever the image or the product or the whatever you're using. Um, I'm sure, you know, even, even Erwin, you know, prior to this meeting going off, he joked around, he said his autonomous mowers said that they were running, but they weren't, they were on the charging station. So he had to physically go in as a human and intervene. And, and so, uh, it's, it's, we're, I mean, it's technology, you know, and we're getting there and, and we're having fun with it. So. I'm wondering if there's some way you could guys can do some uh, cost sharing with the, in a region where you have a, a few go golf courses nearby where one one guy runs this stuff and gets the data and then then you figure out a way to share some of the data that's um, useful to the rest of the rest of the group. So it seemed like there's some value. Yeah, it's, it's, maybe. So that's something something we thought about as you know, uh, you know, something you could opt into as a turf club customer, for example, where where you could say, all right, you know. I'm okay with sharing my data, but on, on an, an anonymized basis, right? Kind of like, hey, this is regional or statewide or, or, or countywide or whatever. Not, hey, this is specific. This is my specific property. Or maybe you could even input like a range of your budget within your property, right? So you could, you could look at people who have similar budgets to you. I mean, and we have all this data, you know, then you can just kind of compare and contrast. And, you know, there's pitfalls in that, right? I mean, everybody's property is unique and, and we, we, we want to empower our superintendents um, you know, we certainly don't want to set them up to be criticized by, uh, you know, green chairs or, or, or property owners or board of governors or anything like that, right? We want to empower them and, and, and give them the information they need. But, um, you know, I, I, when I was a superintendent, the worst thing was I had this golf course, you know, less than a mile down the street. And it's always, well, they're doing this and they only spent this and this is how much they're using in labor. And it's, it got to be like, well, we have different problems and we have different issues and, you know, we have different maintenance practices and different standards and you have different expectations. So, you know, how valuable is this comparison? So, you know, you get to the point where it's like, eh, we don't want big brother with the technology. We just, we just want this to help us. So, No, I'd be more like predictive, like, you know, we're, we're entering a period of, you know, um, any bluegrass weevils or, or, you know, sort of like what Syngenta is doing or, uh, you oh, know, yeah. a dollar spot, those types of things. You can, you know, one golf course probably has enough variability that it would, uh, probably be valuable to a regional area on uh, oh, for sure conditions. for sure, for I, sure. Th I think that sort of sharing larry that sort of information sharing is very useful i think we've all got to be very careful on how we share data though i think sharing experience is fantastic but sharing numbers could, could be quite dangerous to all of us because what nobody wants is anybody to sort of be I'm saving such and such a percent. I'm saving such and such because nothing ever follows on due to those management practices. Um, but I think a lot of, a lot of it comes down to um, the fact that technology is technology and it moves on very quickly. So if you build that sort of 
calendar up. So 10 years ago, we really hadn't got any of this. Maybe the odd in-ground sensor, how accurate they were then, we don't know, but we have to go with it. So, but if we take it as 10 years ago, there was nothing. Five years ago, all of this was available in some sort of format, be it a dashboard, be it NDVI, be it soil data. So at that point, we were all, yeah, this is great, but what we want is this. So what we were all wanting five years ago, we have now. Um, and then what we've got now, everybody comes up with the same problems, the same, same questions, the same experiences, the same things they want to change. And that's the next five years. So in a nutshell, the end user, the experience gainer is our biggest product developer because without this uh, critique almost, we can't develop and move on to bring this data together, to learn what the data means together, to automate, automate, automate this data. And there's so many different angles, automate irrigation, automate the autonomous mowers, automate the drone, automate what happens from it, uh, automate what the information that the agronomist receives. So the, there's a lot of different angles, and I think the next 24 months especially is going to be very exciting, especially with, with places like Penn State um, and, and the other worldwide turf, turf research institutes and, and educational establishments. With them having access to the data and the academic knowledge that these guys have got, teaching us how to translate it back into a commercial product, it, it's going to be a wonderful time for all of us. Yeah, I mean, you imagine, you imagine you get to the day where there's this, this you know, this orchestra of, of, of sensors, remote, various remote sensing techniques, spitting back to your, your irrigation controller, you know, adjusting run times and having your irrigation controller spitting, you know, when certain heads are running back to your auto automatic mowers so they can avoid the heads as they're on and they can go mow their things at night. And it's, it's, you know, it's, it's exciting to think of all the possibilities and there's any number of them like that. And, and it's a great point, Adam. I mean, these are, it's, a, it's exciting that we're at the point where we have all the data to make this possible, right? Before we didn't necessarily have that. It was like, gee, I wonder if, wouldn't it be great if we had an autonomous mower, you know, and now we do, you know, wouldn't it be great if we had a drone or, or we had these, these other great remote sensing opportunities or, or this, this uh, job board data. And I mean, now we have it, right? So it, it's just a matter of, you're right, what's the next five years look like? And I think that it's exciting to think the things we'll be able to do. I, yeah. I want to share with you a, a little tiny life experience that I got from having sensors on Tuesday, Monday of this week. Um, the Belfry Golf Complex in the UK They've had absolutely no technology at all apart from um, a spec meters weather station. So we, we've installed the sensors and I'm sat there with Angus and Chris, the, the head, of a, head of courses and one of their deputies. And we're configuring the dashboard. And from somebody that's had no data to the shock factor of it, we look... As, as we made the dashboard, dashboard live, um, the, the sensors were coming live and the 17th green on the Brabazon course at 17 centimetres, the, the moisture was only 15%. This is coming after 10 days of pretty much continual rainfall in the UK, where Chris's first reaction was, hey, that, that's really dry. It shouldn't be that. And these, these are USGA greens. So... I was like, well, let's get your TDR, some four centimetre spikes, and let's have a look at the top surface. So we've gone out, measured the top four centimetres with the TDR. That's at 27%. And my first question to him was, we've just gone through six weeks of seriously dry weather. And now we've had two weeks of, of, of wet weather. So in that dry period, when, when did you spray a, a surfactant to hydrate? To, to hold that moisture up in the top layer. And it was pretty much just under two weeks earlier. Well, that gave the exact answer to why that at 17 centimetres, it was ridiculously dry. But the top surface was at, at 26, 27%. And if I could have recorded the facial reaction 
and the wow factor, it would have been brilliant for all of us because it was just a real visible effect of what data gives you. That's a good transition to, of the story. We're going to move to um, give Erwin some time here. We haven't, I, I dropped that so Erwin, I thought you actually, I missed it or something when I dropped that early on. Um, so let's turn over to you. Um, we've got a little over five minutes, but if we go a little long, that's fine too. We're not on a necessarily time crunch, but uh, why don't you tell us about your autonomous mowers and um, all the things that you're doing there in Germany. So, so for everyone here, I'm in Germany. And then uh, I basically had every robot you can imagine except the Cup Cadet because they don't work in Europe, but they've been per they pull the plug, so that doesn't exist anywhere anymore. Um, basically, it all started when we, we had the driving range and we were like, oh, it's such a pain in the, to maintain it. Like you have to close it for the player, you have to pick up the ball, then you can mow. So that's a lot of time close, so lose of money. We're like, oh, I wish we could have a robot that could do that all day long. So we, we take the big move from the robotic that's in the US, it's now by Echo Robotic. And then that robot actually have like protection on the blade so you can mow with the ball. And then, so that was the first one we bought. And then we would instantly like be like blown away, like, wow, that's so good. 24 seven, the grass is perfect. In December, my driving range was looking better than June last year. I was like, this is the best. Let's see if we, if we can do that for the entire course. So we started thinking, what robot is suitable for the course because here I have three course, two 18 hole, and one is a crazy extreme design and one is more like, like a park not normal one. And then, um, so different design with different robot too. So what I did, I said, hey, let's put every company in. So I first, I had John Deere that came with their autonomous conventional robot. So I called them a slap on. Basically it's a normal affair where you put a computer on it and then it, Emo for you. That's that's a dead. That's a very good technology on a dead platform. We want a robot that can leak all when you're not here. That can that can do lose signal on anything. It's really dead dead platform to me. So after that, I had uh, the first example of the Turflinks uh, free wheel drive because of my extreme design. Basically, Turflinks is a conventional ferro mover but fully electric and no it. And I was blown away by the quality. It's wireless, so you can install anywhere you want, as big as you want. And then basically you just draw the fairway and draw where you can turn and some pathway. And after that, on your phone, you say, oh, today you're gonna move one, two, three, and nine, 19, 18. And then you will calculate automatically the way where you have to go and, and everything. It's blown away. Um, the problem with that technology is extremely expensive. You talk about 150,000 euro per mower. Um, and then on the extreme design, it was not so well because when the mower was going sideways like that, the GPS position was actually false. And then I had like some gap between the two lines. So I was like, ah, it's a great technology, but it's not what I need today. So we look into the Usvarna and then it's, it's, it's a different mindset as, long, as soon as you come in the Svarna. Because it's one robot per fairway. You need to install the electric. You need to think you're gonna have a charging station. And then, uh, then as well, the quality you've got, you wonder because you come from a real smaller to razor blades. You're like, oh, that's gonna be way different. So I did, I did a test two years ago, just by one. And then I let it run on my fairway and it was like, and suddenly, like, I was like, hook up. I was like, wow, the quality is so good. It's silent, it costs nothing, almost need no maintenance. So this year we buy 22 of them. And I install uh, on my open course, 18 roll, and on the non short course, I install three of them. And then uh, it's a meh this year. Um, last week, I had a big problem. All of them were stuck in a charging station for no reason. And, no, and I could not solve the problem. So basically I had no more for one week. Lucky we still have the normal conventional mower. So turning into, into robotic bring a new sort of problem. Then you have to, to think how to solve them. One of the things too, it's you don't have the, the groomers anymore. So you have to think a new maintenance plan. So when, when you, a lot of people think, oh, I got a robot. I can put my staff somewhere else. Yeah, you're gonna need your staff to do the next job the robot don't do anymore. So now I need someone 
either to blow the fairway, either to roll the fairway, to struggle my fairway. So it's, it's something you have to think before head. Don't just think like, oh, I'm going to save 80 hours a week. Yeah, you might actually save only 40 hours a week. Hey, Erwin, I think Stephen has a question. Um, yeah, yeah, Erwin, I, I have a question if you don't mind. So the, the Husqvarna, the automowers that you're using, um, they don't, and correct me if I'm wrong, they don't necessarily mow in like a striped pattern, correct? Like they, they kind of just go and do their own thing and, and go in whatever pattern they want, or can you make them mow in a striped pattern? So that's the no, first they, question. They only, they only mow in a random pattern. So there is two yeah. mode. There is um, circular, mo uh, circular mowing. So they have a sensor on the, on the disc unit. So as soon as it get stronger, they feel there is more grass. So they will start mowing in cycle all around it for six meters wide. And then it's, it's wonderful. Like when I have fair rings on my fairway, they will come and mow five or six times in a day in this place. So it keeps the, the wall surfaces uniform. It's crazy, crazy good. But otherwise, yeah, just amazing. Your random pattern, it's not very effective because technically a robot can move 15,000 square meter, but you can only have 5,000 effective square meter because they will drive five or six times in the same place. Um, also bring the things that with the design, you don't have stripe anymore. Then you have to explain to your member why there is no stripe on the fairway anymore. And <laughs> right. what I see too, I have some fairway with more touch, or at least that's what we think for the moment. And then the disc is actually cutting into the, that touch and it makes some stripe, like very horrible looking stripes, sometimes everywhere. So I have to think like, whoa, I might need to mow once a week with a conventional mower just to, to keep the quality on them. And then um, one, in my opinion, the, the biggest problem is you constantly need to pay attention to them. First, because you, if they stuck in a station, they're not gonna mow. And uh, they are very slow. It's not like a normal mower. You have a problem, you give it to the mechanic, two hours outside, you mow all your fairway in five hours, finish. The robot, they need time to get everything. Like if you forget to change the blade and you start to tear in your grass, you're gonna need three or four days to get all the grass cut once again with the proper blades. So you have to be proactive constantly. You can't let something sleep because you will pay the price for it otherwise. Makes sense. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it, it's, you know, using traditional mowers has, has similar challenges, not maybe not similar, but different challenges. Right. So, you know, it's just the trade off, you know, you have to figure out how to best work that into your program. I, th I think, I think it's brilliant. I mean, I, it, it's so fascinating to me. Um, it, particularly those who's on auto mowers, they're, they're super fascinating. How often do you find you have to, uh, change the blades out? What's the maintenance? Um, you know, um, so, as opposed to, there's a curve on them. Like once, once you introduce the robot, you're going to change the blade every week, like even maybe more. And then after like a month or two, the grass start to be f finer on the grass. It's, it's slower too. The, the, the grass is slower. And then, so you start to change them to every two weeks, three weeks. I, I don't go more than one month with the set. It's like really not possible for me. But I mean, a set of blade costs three euro. So like, I can change them all year long. If it costs me 1,500 euro, it's not, gonna, it's not even a third of normal mower sharpening in, in terms of labor. So it's just like, change them every week, I will still save money. Right, yeah, that makes sense. That's, that's, that's incredible. But that, that's, what, um... that's say you really need to be proactive because if, if you wait too long, you're gonna need another week just to get a good quality back. And then you really need to be proactive. I'm, I'm, I assume that you're, you know, the members at your golf course, you know, they're, I'm sure they're very proud of, of, uh, uh, of how forward thinking you are and very accepting of the technology. But, you know, you, like you mentioned, those, those, those Barna mowers, they move pretty slow. So it's not like, you know, they're, you know, someone's not going to see them coming and they're going to be in the middle of a backswing and the mower is going to come and mow them over or something, you know, like they, they can see it, but you know, they don't, do they have any type of uh, object detection? You know, would they mow over a golf ball? And, and what has like kind of, what do you think the biggest pitfalls would be? Or how would you explain to, um, you know, someone to talk to their members and say, hey, this is a good thing, you know? Like, kind of, what, what kind of recommendations would you have? That's a very good question. So first, the uh, Usvana, they have an ultra wave sensor, but they still have a touch and go. So if they feel something is close to them, they're gonna reduce the speed to very, very slow. And then if the things doesn't move, they will just eat it like an e-cart or golf bag or the ball is not gonna be enough, they're gonna mow the ball. 
But like if something is solid, they will just eat it, bump, and then reverse. So like a monster still in the front, he just put his feet and then they will bump and reverse. Um, but there's a problem too. With the member, not so much, but with the tourist, they see the robot doing some cycle or they see the robot coming close to them, they turn off the robot. Then it, do, then it goes into alarm, then you have to come. And that's, that's all about oh, education. Man. And it's my biggest issue at the moment. I got it like once every day. In it's like average. at a zoo. It's like at a zoo you where you gotta some, like, please don't feed the animals. <laughs> yeah, put some waterproof signs in the mowers that say like, you know, this will self-destruct if you turn it off or something, right? <laughs> well, we, we, we are in the process to design some stickers for it. But like, sometimes I'm like, hey people, what you have in mind is, is not your home, it's not your golf course, don't touch my robot. <laughs> but um, that's things happen. Uh, and I, what was your other question? No, just, just basically around like member acceptance of it, you know, like okay, I, so yeah, I was saying. Um, uh, when we got the, the first in the driving range, so it's, it's far from the member, they don't really see it. But as soon as we introduced them on the, on the fairway, we had two groups, like I would say the female player, they would all be like, wow, that's gorgeous, they do a good job and things like that. The male player, they were more like, oh, it's cutting job on people, it's not really great. And as soon as the quality show up, they were all like, oh, that's perfect. I want that every day. I mean, we used to cut two times or three times a week. Now it's cut seven days a week. Like you come on a weekend, you still have a perfect quality fairway. And then, so that the quality itself sell, sell, sell the product. Kevin, did you have a question? You, you were yeah, good. my question, Erwin, was when, like, um, are you able to let these go out at night? Um, like that, that's kind of my, like, I envision it, you know, like, especially on our property, I would love to send out a fleet in the middle of the night, <laughs> to be quite honest, because, you know, the biggest gripe we get is, well, why are you guys out here mowing when we're out here playing? Um, not that, it, you know, it's yeah. you always are fighting it, but it'd be just something that would be interesting for me, um, especially in the private sector over here is, you know, and I imagine there'd be some benefits in terms of less disease, that kind of stuff. Like, I'm just wondering if you guys have looked at, you know, mowing at night over in the UK just to kind of eliminate some dew, suppress, dew and that kind of stuff. So, so my use of that, they run 24 seven. So day and night, um, you, you, you can adjust, like you can mow less, but you have to adjust the surfaces. Like there's a chart that says if you want only seven hours of work, you can only mow two and a half thousand square meter that will ensure that the robot come enough. Um, so in terms of Usvana, they can mow with the irrigation system on, they will burn the sprinkler and just reverse somewhere else. They, they, they're so light, they won't damage any sprinkler. If you, if you look at the turflings, which is the size of a normal fairway mower with normal reels, you're gonna destroy your, your sprinkler right away. But there is a technology that you, in, in, you increment in them that say, hey, I'm on fairway 12, turn the irrigation off on fairway 12 while I'm mowing. And as soon as you go, you turn the irrigation back on. So you, you literally eliminate all your problems. It, it brings one question. What's happened if your robot goes in alarm at night? You will only see on the morning, oh shit, it did not work last night. So I know there's a company in France that actually uh, sell a service of uh, surveillance at night. So they, they will look for you, your robot to make sure it's working at night. So you can go sleep and easy. You know someone is like a surveillance company. And then... Uh, so if any problem, they can take over, restart the robot, and that's it. I don't want to cut the conversation short, but I know that we're at uh, like an hour and five, hour and six minutes um, already. And I want to give everybody a chance to give a final word. I think that um, we could probably pick any one of these topics and we could end up bringing it back out as its own episode um, with multiple people talking about it. But I think this was good scratching the surface and the information everybody shared was awesome. So. Um, what I will do is uh, maybe just unmute yourself. And if anybody wants to say any last final words or promote anything, um, obviously you all have companies and uh, golf courses and things that you want to promote, but uh, I'll, I'll start at the bottom um, of my screen with Steve. Um, Steven, if you wanted to say any last final things. No, I just thank you to anyone who listened or anyone who is interested. Um, <laughs> a lot of advancements in, in, in turf going on and um, it's exciting to be a part of it. So thanks for setting this up, John. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you for uh, participating, Adam. 
Yeah, uh, just reiterate what Stephen just said, really. Um, thanks for the invite and, and accepting me to be part of this webinar this evening. I think it's been very informative for everyone, especially ha having a couple of superintendents involved, sort of with Erwin and Kevin, that are using this technology in a practical perspective as well. I think it's made, made it a little bit more understanding for anyone that's listening. And... Um, I'd just, just like to sort of say, any, anyone wants any more, any more information, just reach out to us, um, whether it's our own products or anyone else's. Um, we're all in this game to educate each other. So let's let's just see where we can take the industry to, to the next level. Yeah, awesome. I'll put a link to for everybody's company and golf course um, in the YouTube comments on here so people can link to your site and get you. Uh, Jason, you're up. <clears throat> well, to... Um, add to what Stephen and, and Adam were already talking about. Uh, thanks for listening to us speak for uh, an, well over an hour now. And, um, you know, we're all pretty heavy winded talkers and, and we have a lot to offer uh, the golf industry from experience level, but also from a technology level. Uh, and it's a passion. It's a true passion. Uh, I shared my email address in the chat window. So if you want to get a hold of me uh, via email, um, I'm always willing to talk turf, um, not just try and sell you a turf club. And awesome. uh, appreciate lastly, that. lastly uh, I wanted to uh, just mention the fact that we are partnered now with Soil Scout and we are the distributor in the U.S. Uh, for Soil Scout. So um, that goes along there. And um, I also wanted to add that um, personal too, you know, if you wanted to talk, you know, turf to turf, but, but, you know, head to head, you know, I've managed turf for, for a while and I know that it, you know, can take an emotional toll. Um, on many people, especially now in, in the state of the pandemic and, and, and the heat and, and whatever, you know, I'm, I'm uh, another ear to listen and, and maybe, you know, hopefully some advice to offer. So. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Kevin. Um, yeah. So I, I would just like to, you know, kind of talk to people that haven't really kind of adopted technology at their property. Um, if you're looking into it, don't take, the approach that this is going to be a crystal ball and it's going to solve all my problems. Um, the reality is, is the way I looked at it and the way I adopted it was as this is a toolbox. Um, and basically you want everything, you know, our golf course, everything we have from our chem shed to fertilizer to everything. You want to have everything underneath one umbrella to have all your tools in your toolbox per se. Um, so, and that's, you know, giving everything a chance. Yes. There's going to be a learning curve. Yes. There's going to be some stuff. Um, that you're going to get confused by that you might have to ask questions about. But the reality is, is being able to, you know, utilize this stuff and get it at your property sooner, you're going to start actually noticing trends and making more informed decisions. Um, we've seen it in terms of irrigation efficiency at our property, labor efficiency, et cetera. You know, you're going to get your return on investment probably in the first year if you actually embrace it. And that's, that's the biggest thing I can say is all this stuff is, really to push towards a more sustainable uh, industry per se. And I think we can all do a better job of backing off on chemicals, fungicides, and by and large, just not creating an environment where our grass plant isn't, doesn't have a chance to survive, um, which can happen with over fertilizing, over watering. So with tools like this, I think it's really been eye opening for me, you know, being able to back down our chemical use, fertilizer use, um, so I just encourage everyone to kind of, you know, reach out. Like Jay said, um, I'm easily a phone call away, a text away from somebody if they want to email. Um, if you're interested in this technology and you want to ask more questions, go ahead and give me a call. Um, it's, you know, it's not a big secret. In fact, I think we all can benefit from sharing more. Awesome. Thanks, uh, Erwin, you're up. Um, first of all, thanks John for having us here. And then, um, as I say, as John said, we just scratch the surfaces of each subject. And then um, if, you have, if you want more information about robot, feel free to contact me. I put my mail on the, on the chat. And I just want to say soon, so like end of the month, uh, I have my own website that's coming up. That will be all about every robot on the market. I add them all. If you have any questions, just feel free to, to contact me. I can help you for your personal case. You have a website for that yet? Do you know the URL? Uh, it's the French backyard.com, but he's not really open yet. End of the woods. Perfect. Larry. 
Okay. Well, hey, thank all of you guys for um, for, for participating, and and I, I'd really encourage anybody out there that's got any interest at all in uh, stepping up the game and trying some uh, more uh, direct data management and in uh, in the course to try some of these technologies. I mean, it's really important to get these things moving. I think also maybe uh, as you're looking at uh, hiring people, you might want to take a look and see how comfortable they are working with uh, at least some computer systems because that's uh, this is the way it's going to go. I don't know. We're not sure how fast it's moving there, but uh, definitely this is uh, that's what happened. Uh, I think it was Adam said, you know, is you know, what you wanted uh, now is what shows up five years from now, and that's pretty much uh, the case. And we're way behind ag. So there's a lot of uh, a lot of this technology coming over from ag that's been around for a long time, and it's fine and nice to see it uh, get adopted. Yeah, support these guys. Yeah, I think the the key takeaway for me, and looking you know going back to the beginning with Greensight, is just like you know you need the early adopters to help build the technology and make it make it that much better, right? And so um, they've shown that they are using that data and building better and better systems, and you know the AI and the Turf Cloud and um, all the different things that Greensight's doing, uh, as well as the other companies that are associated with everybody. Um, so I will say awesome for everybody coming. I really appreciate it. I got to go back and watch the first 10 minutes when I got bounced out of here. Um, uh, I'll give a shout out to the golf course management program. We're still taking applications for the fall semester. Link below. Um, and two years cancer free yesterday. Shout out to that for me too. So um, with that, we're going to sign off. This will be up on YouTube and you can watch it later and I'll put all the links below for all the uh, websites that uh, everybody in here mentioned and we'll see you next time. Brilliant.